Good morning. That's better. I'm Rob Pegarero. I write a technology column for the Washington Post. They uh, invited me here, not for the extensive collection of mashups I've got in my, my copy of iTunes, but hopefully because they can ask some interesting questions. We're actually going to start with a little uh, multimedia presentation here. Are we ready to roll? I think so. Maestro. Dr. Brown is dangerous. He's a real nutcase. If you hang around with him, you're going to end up in big trouble. Oh, yes, sir. So what do we do? Well, I hope I'm not disturbing anything. Oh, uh, this is my uh, doc. My uncle. Doc. Brown. Send me a letter. Who the hell is Clara? All you had to say is I don't love you and I don't want to see you anymore. Have you ever uh, been in a situation where you knew you had to act a certain way, but when you got there, you didn't know if you could go through with it? Hell, I'm in it with you and I don't even understand it. I have to live my life according to what I believe is right. <laughs> Touching, wasn't it? The first question I'd ask is here, we've got this fine piece of uh, cinematic art composed of bits and pieces of two movies. Who's necessarily hurt? Or is there any real economic damage, or is it simply a question of who should take more offense to it, the producers of Brokeback Mountain or Back to the Future? Who wants to take a stab at that? <laughs> well, parody uh, and satire uh, are always uh, things that uh, cause offense uh, to someone. <laughs> uh, and uh, parody and satire and highly transformative uh, uses of pre-existing works uh, are things that actually cause us to look at both things like Brokeback Mountain and Back to the Future in a different light. Uh, and it's that kind of creative commentary uh, that I think is actually wonderful to, uh, to have available to all of us. Uh, and uh, so I think that's a, it, it's, no, not, it's, not, it's not who specifically is offended, but is there really uh, some new light uh, that shed on the, on the works that uh, already exist, and is there a new work that transforms uh, the work in a, in a new and creative way? Well, I have to admit that I have a huge weakness for parody. And I still remember when I was a kid, I regard one of the high points of my life when I discovered Mad Magazine <laughs> and I began bringing it home to my mother's utter horror, of course. Um, the real problem here uh, is that <laughs> Ordinarily, you can have markets and samples or something like this. We're getting them in music sampling now. But of course, you aren't going to get that in parody because the precise problem is uh, that the, the thing is being taken off on. And I will also give you a case that I find rather difficult, which is in the movie The Devil's Advocate. There is a scene in there where you have a sculpture in the background of the satanic orgy taking place. That sculpture was actually a modified version adapted from a sculpture that's in the National Cathedral called right Ex Nihilo. And the sculptor, who was a religious man, done it for religious purposes as well as a high commission, was not happy at all because he felt that um, you know, parody of something that he took you know, seriously as a religion, as a religious matter, um, was not appropriate. 
And unfortunately for all of us, the case was settled, and so it never, we never got a decision. But I think some judge was probably very thankful that he didn't have to decide that one. So I think that the, um, the, from the creator's point of view, those people who are sampling and sourcing these uh, 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 various well-known assets and creating new uh, expressions from them are being playful and referential. Uh, and um, the, the genie is out of the bottle. Uh, the idea that uh, one can uh, mandate controls against that kind of behavior when the tools of reproduction and uh, distribution access and what have you are so widely distributed uh, kind of begs the question, how? How does one do that? And uh, from an artist's point of view, uh, there are, I work with creators, that's my background. And artists, um, you know, artists are already, already and have for many, 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 many centuries uh, been creating derivative work. And we just happen to live in a world of uh, a fulsome world of a broader opportunity for, der for derivative work. And I think the, uh, the tensions around copyright and the uh, concerns around misuse are um, uh, on par with the opportunities for uh, uh, new works being created and concerns about the constraints that are imposed by traditional copyright. Well, but I think also you have to separate two issues. And one is the question of can you do it without permission, and the other is the question of payment. And um, Judge Pierre Laval of the Second Circuit, who's written quite a bit of copyright opinions, commented that you really do need to separate those because um, you know, there's no reason why you couldn't give artists or creators license to take material from other sources, but that doesn't mean they should take it for free. And certainly, in my own hope, is that eventually we will get things like digital rights management, and then you'll get markets so that people can take samples of this. And, um, and you know, hopefully quite cheaply, so that you can take samples from Back to the Future and Brokeback Mountain and put them together in some transformative work. And um, that it'll be the same way that you sort of buy the crayons you use to make a, to you know, do a drawing, or the paints you use to paint a picture. And um, there's no particular reason why the inputs into creativity should be free. You, know, you have to pay for the computer and you have to pay for the printer. That's an interesting point because DRM as it works now doesn't let you do that. Uh, it would be as if you can only buy the box of crayons and you can't break the crayon apart or use the, the colors in it in a way you, you desire. DRM that we have right now, the, the fair play on my iPod, whatever you might have on a Zune, it doesn't allow that sort of sharing. You have a situation where either something has no controls attached to it at all it's an MP3 or it's a DVD, which effectively has no controls attached. Is anyone, the DRM vendors don't seem interested in creating software that allows that. The major copyright holders don't seem interested in adopting DRM that allows that. Is I that going to change? I think, that's, I think that's a big question, and I, I totally disagree with you about <laughs> the... Uh, about DRM as an enabler of, uh, uh, of new creative works. In fact, it's a, it's a way of trying, at least it's a, as it's been deployed so far, it's a way of, of blocking uh, sort of reuse of materials and trying to control the, 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 that. Now, I think that part of what uh, the challenge of today is for the entertainment industry especially is how to try to create li licensing mechanisms, lightweight licensing mechanisms, so that there is some opportunity. Uh, so I think that to the extent that uh, YouTube is able to make uh, uh, a deal so that users who post uh, mashups and remixes uh, online uh, are able to get some, uh, some money flowing, I think that's, that's all to the good. Um, but right now, I think DRM is, is an inhibitor of that. Uh, and actually, one of the things that uh, I'm really concerned about is uh, DRM uh, as, a, as kind of an uh, anti-consumer activity. Uh, and I'm hosting a conference uh, in, uh, in March about digital rights management, uh, copyright, and consumer protection, because I think DRM uh, deployments so far have been anti-consumer, and uh, there have been a number of issues uh, raised about DRM. But I think our concern is to try to like, let's, let's see how user creativity uh, can uh, be enabled rather than crushed, uh, either through DRM or through overbroad copyright protection. 
Yeah, and so uh, I, I come down on the side of having watched DRM fail consistently over the period, and, and there may be some <clears throat> solutions that I haven't seen yet, but DRM tends to be catnip for those who would like to unleash the uh, content uh, uh, and uh, break the software that uh, is designed to uh, quote unquote protect it. I think a lot of studios, and I'm in touch with many of them, are exploring the idea of licensing into a mashup environment where people can be playful with that content. And I think that uh, there's a, um, a real understanding that actually additional value gets created by uh, allowing those assets to be uh, played with, uh, recombined, uh, as we saw there, just one very small piece of evidence of the many, 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 many thousands of these kinds of uh, remixes that are out there. Also, secondarily, there's, there's, it's not simply, it's, it's not black and white from my point of view. I don't think it's either DRM controls or you know, uh, everything's for fun and for free. I think two things are operating here. One is algorithms need to be created that allow people to participate in the economics of mashups that you know, choose mm -hmm. to license into them. That's number one. Uh, and that would presume audio and video licensing and some pro rata apportionment. And I think the, a lot of people are thinking about that now. Mm -hmm. And secondly, there, we're, we need to mention fair use. Um, and we need to mention fair use as a, a method of uh, inspiring additional and, and new creativity. Um, fair use is a very important matter and uh, continues to be a relatively gray area in terms of how uh, copyright holders are able to protect themselves, but it also continues to be an obstacle uh, um, because the, the, how you prove something is used in a fair use context is not black and white. And um, uh, we really uh, look at fair use as the uh, great opportunity for uh, creators to um, um, uh, invent new things. Steve, I'm not sure who you are. We didn't introduce oh, ourselves. Okay. Um, I, I have a, a, a company called Rever. All right. And Rever actually is a, uh, uh, in the online video sharing space. And what Rever does is it pays creators for yeah. their creativity. It's a video monetization service. Mm -hmm. And we've been fighting for creator rights for creators to get paid since the day we launched the service. And we are extremely um, vigilant Rever. about copyright. <laughs> We yeah. believe that uh, the people who are creating the content deserve to control the distribution of their content. Mm -hmm. But we do it in a very open fashion. We allow content to move freely across the internet, and we track it and monetize it wherever it goes in a freely mm -hmm. moving environment. We do not use any DRM. We are not interested in mm -hmm. uh, trying to compete with uh, script kiddies in Sweden who want to crack the code of any DRM mm -hmm. that we might imply. Uh, and we've had a very successful business, I think, the uh, um, the best online creators out there, the Zay Franks, Lonely Girl 15, uh, mm -hmm. Two with Chris, MS7 Friends, people not everybody in this room may have heard of, but there's a subculture of young creators who are emerging very importantly online, who are not only using our service, but it's, it's revealing a, a, a behavior, an online behavior, where people are pulling content from various sources, are using fair use, are inventing new, uh, new ways of uh, content, uh, new genres and formats. And, we're really excited about that. So I come into the room as sort of a creator advocate, and I'm, I'm really interested in that side of the equation. I might say, I'm Jim DeLong. I'm from the Progress and Freedom Foundation, the senior fellow who's in charge of our um, intellectual property program. And you can find everything we know and more on ipcentral.info. I'm Pam Samuelson. I teach uh, copyright law at University of California at Berkeley. Uh, I'm a director of the Center for Law and Technology. Uh, I've been writing about the challenges of digital technology for intellectual property law for more than uh, 20 years. And I, uh, like Steve, uh, think fair use is a really important principle. And a principle that I think that uh, a very large proportion of people who do remixes and, um, uh, and, um, and mashups actually uh, try to subscribe to. That is to say, part of the reason that I think people are, are trying to do highly transformative things uh, when they are making these mashups and remixes uh, is because they think that, in fact, it's within the spirit of fair use. <coughs> they're not mm -hmm. just trying to sort of directly free ride. They're really trying to engage uh, the best of them uh, in it, uh, which isn't to say that there aren't some that occasionally go over the line. Uh, but I think that, 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 that part of this remix mashup culture is let's make something highly transformative. Let's add something new. Let's try to make sure uh, that, there, that there is some new value that we're really adding. 
Uh, if we're offering in a non-commercial way, if we're not supplanting demand for the original, then that's the kind of thing that uh, seems uh, a canonical fair use uh, to this community. So even though if they don't know all the case law, uh, part of what they're trying to do is actually engage in transformative uses and not in just mere free riding. Well, I have a rather different view of fair use, and that I think a lot of it is transaction cost based. You know, that a lot of it is it's a fair use when getting permission is out of all proportion to the value involved or the time and effort involved. And uh, it seems to me, um, you know, I agree with the goals here, but I just don't see the conflict with the idea that as long as it's easy, you know, like the way, the way I go broke on Amazon lately, one click. You know, yeah, I'd like a sample of that, click. And, you know, as long as um, you have competitive markets, which are developing, so the prices are low, I just don't see why a modest charge for the inputs, which then goes into the creative community, um, is not a good thing. And it seems to me, of course, you can get layers of mashups and mashups and mashups, and you can get some incredible complexities here. But um, my sort of general rule is the more money the artists get, the more we're going to get. Two things, um, if I may respond to that. One is, is that um, in the traditional... Uh, corporate media, which I spent most of my life, mm -hmm. the opportunity for permissions is impoverished. Uh, you yeah. may spend the rest of your, uh, you can make a film and the likelihood that the last deals you sign two years after your film is made are the music rights deals, very much the case across mm -hmm. uh, traditional corporate media. There is a Byzantine uh, rights holder slash complex relationship with unions and guilds, uh, none of which have been worked out up until this point and none of which are going to be worked out in the, not in the near future. So I think that the opportunity for people to be playful with Brokeback Mountain mm. and Back to the Future, mm -hmm. it's a non-starter. You, you would spend uh, years trying to acquire those rights from all the rights holders in the current schema. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that, that um, fair use is actually the, the uh, balance to the problem that people are having. Because satire, uh, parody, um, new works, the opportunity to imagine something uh, uh, different and of a greater value by combining assets mm -hmm. that had a different meaning at the time they were created. That is the history of creativity. Mm -hmm. That is the history of great writing. That is the history of great art. I don't think there's any great artist who didn't stand on the shoulders of the artist behind him or no, her. And yeah, so we're, we're dealing with mm -hmm. um, the need for some um, sort of a sober view of what it takes to create a robust creative environment and the copyright issues that have been promulgated or the copyright extensions that have been promulgated over the last 100 years or 50 years have created some very serious setbacks to the commons of people who would like to create. And I would suggest that in the real world of Hollywood and uh, networks and um, movie studios and what have you, there has to be a relaxation of these uh, permissions or else you will <laughs> see the new creativity that drives forward in art there's sort of two issues we've raised here. One, it's a very good point that, I mean, if you spend any time at the online movie download sites, you'll see Hollywood movie studios have trouble selling their own works in their entirety, much less to, in little bits and pieces to people who want to mash them up. Mm. That, that is neither, that's not a technological issue. It's not strictly an economic issue. It's, it's all the above, I guess. So it's the sociological, political, what have you. On the other hand, all this talking, is, is there necessarily, are mashups necessarily getting quashed by movie studio lawsuits left and right? Is that a big effort for the studios compared to, say, stopping people from posting entire copies of movies that are not transformative in any way, except maybe to transform away that pesky FBI warning at the, the beginning of the flick? <laughs> in the music business, yes. The music business has been extremely aggressive in protecting samples and have sued a whole lot of people for uh, using samples. And while the movie studios learned a lesson from what the, movie, the music business has just been through, um, we're at the earliest stages of this kind of creativity online. This is, the tools have just been proliferated. The <clears throat> creativity we're seeing now is you know, spring training for what is going to be a very mm -hmm. long, uh, a very interesting evolution of online uh, media as an art form. And so I would suggest that, that this is the right time to be talking about uh, how we address these issues. Of course, one problem is if you read the copyright law, it's sort of like this garbage dump of layers 
of <laughs> trying to solve one problem after another. Mm. And one thing that I hope doesn't happen is somebody suddenly tries to solve things in one great stroke. Though, I have to admit, I sometimes daydream of a clean sheet copy law, right, law revision. But I mentioned that to one of the content company representatives, and she literally turned white with fear of what would happen if you tried to do anything like that now. Well, but I think it actually is time to start That's something thinking. you guys can it's, do. Uh, it's time, actually, to start, uh, to start trying to articulate, um, if not a, a new model copyright law, at least some copyright principles that actually have some coherence, uh, that are straightforward, that are much simpler uh, than the statute that we have. The statute we have today is more than 200 pages long. And I'm telling you all that about three or four provisions are impenetrable. You cannot understand them, uh, and in fact, even the, the high priests uh, who study uh, copyright law cannot totally tell you what they mean. I'm glad um, to hear you say that, because I was um, reading section 114 yesterday, and I thought I'd just gotten stupid, or stupider, I should say. No. So no. thank you, Doc. So actually, I actually have, uh, so uh, if there's anyone out there who's, whose face is going to turn white, now's the time. Um, <laughs> I'm actually starting a project to, uh, to try to do a model, simple copyright law, uh, that uh, that uh, with a group of uh, copyright professionals uh, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully uh, some advisors uh, from the economics and from technology as well as mm -hmm. from content industries. Um, I think it's time that we have to do something simpler. It was fine to have a really complex law when all it did is, is regulate <coughs> this intra-industry or this inter-industry, mm -hmm. copyright industry, sort of battle. Once copyright law applies to all of us and applies to what we do with information every day, if it's not comprehensible, if it's not simple, if it doesn't have kind of coherent norms, then what you're going to end up with is what we have today, which is this huge divide between what many people, especially in the content industry, think copyright law means and what ordinary people think it means. And that gap isn't good. We need to find a way to get something simpler, more straightforward, and I absolutely agree with you. The idea that, you know, that, that mashups uh, are, are a different class of issue from the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, mm -hmm. which was the mm -hmm. sort of the issue for the last five years. Yes. Mashup mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. creative reuse. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's something that actually we should be encouraging and finding. If not just room for a privilege through fair use, then we should be finding uh, ways to have lightweight licensing to make this happen rather than sort of this two-year process of trying to clear rights and then having to pay thousands of thousands of dollars uh, for engaging in creativity, which in fact will not supplant the, the market for the original work. And that's really what we should be looking for, um, things that actually are going to help make this creativity happen rather than stop it. Of course, the studios will tell you they have a terrible time negotiating anything like that because the rights are so tangled. Well, that's what's so interesting about this, uh, this sort of new wave of creativity because you mentioned a sort of a white sheet or a clean sheet approach to copyright. I would direct anybody's attention in this room to efforts like the Creative Commons, which mm -hmm. attempts to simplify along the lines uh, that mm -hmm. we're discussing here, that Pam's talking about, uh, that allow in a digital age the redistribution of content across mm -hmm. these platforms in a way that doesn't require the heavy lifting of uh, you know, lawyers dealing with one item at a time, one right at a time. And secondarily, um, what we find at Reverend, you know, we use Creative Commons. Uh, all the creators who come on our system are opting into a Creative Commons license. That's how we simplify the, uh, the um, uh, uh, copyright issues on our site and our platform. But um, I would mention that, that the, what we're going to find over time is, is that if we don't drive towards simplicity, that the uh, traditional uh, corporate uh, complexities around copyright are going to really, really uh, hurt those businesses as we move into the digital realm. They're, they're not, um, it's not going to be easy for large uh, media uh, properties to deal with the vagaries of the online digital distribution environment. And rather than being defensive, I, I would suggest proactivity is the solution. I like Creative Commons. I think it's fundamentally the right approach where it's simply a recognition that copyright mm -hmm. law, you don't have to reserve every right you're allowed to. You can say, take my song, yeah. do what you want yeah. with it. Mm -hmm. The catch with mashups, though, what works with them is first you see or hear something you have heard before. You hear the first notes of a song by Joy Division, and suddenly there's Missy Elliott on top of it. 
and it's something new that somehow the beats are right on top of each other and it works, people generally aren't making mashups out of indie rock songs or you know, Sundance film releases no one has actually seen or heard yet. So I don't know if that works unless you get major studios and record labels to adopt Creative Commons. Are any of them doing that beyond well, isolated experiments? Well, the studios are certainly um, aware of the problem. I know my colleague Patrick Ross was out at CES. And so he went to one session where people talked about how awful copyright was and everything. They went to another session of people talking about how to use it to do precisely what you're talking about, find new products to market, new ways to sell. You know, in the words of one content executive, I've licensed my grandmother for $3 million. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, greed will come through. Was that <laughs> for, uh, any chance? Greed will come through. And, you know, they are certainly trying to work out ways in which this can be done because they can see that there's a huge market there. Well, I think that there are some uh, studios that are making at least trailers available for, uh, mm -hmm. for mashups. Uh, and I think that the, it's time for some experiments to see whether there are uh, are new ways to, uh, in fact, use the mashups as a kind of uh, um, advertising medium for, uh, for uh, more people to, uh, to uh, essentially pay for the, for the Absolutely. whole content. And yeah. I, um, so mm -hmm. those of you who are watching Super Bowl uh, this, um, uh, this weekend, uh, look for the Doritos ad. Uh, part of what's really interesting now is that the companies like Doritos is, uh, are, are sponsoring contests in some of these online sites to make, uh, to make an ad uh, to be shown on the Super Bowl. And so uh, somebody who made a, uh, who made a remix uh, and uh, some new content uh, is in fact going to have won this contest. And, and so uh, the good thing about that is that it's gotten people more bought into the Doritos uh, as a brand and as something to be, you know, it's growing their fan base rather than uh, cutting back on it. And I think there are opportunities out there uh, for that kind of buy-in by consumers uh, through the mashups uh, that uh, is really an opportunity. In fact, uh, I, one of my students uh, wrote a, a paper uh, uh, recently for me and said uh, that uh, the real question about mashups is can media companies afford to stand idly buy when such golden opportunities exist to capitalize on their assets by allowing and encouraging user-generated content? To I thought that was a great question. <laughs> no, I think the answer is obvious. <laughs> yes, they'll capitalize on it. You know, see, the fundamental view of my organization on this is that it's a mistake to think of consumers versus creators in copyright. It's a mistake to think of markets versus community. You know, property rights and markets are the way in which communities cooperate. And they're really the only effective ways in which communities cooperate, unless you want to go to a regulatory system. And I've been a, regula a regulator, and believe me, you don't want to go there. And you know, it takes time to work these things out. But it seems to me, with entrepreneurial energy and such, they are getting worked out, and actually rather fast. I, I would also uh, want to point out that it's, it's not just about reward. It's not just about monetization. Mm -hmm. A lot of the creativity that's happening, whether it's the Doritos ad or whether it's uh, you know, any number of marketing efforts to engage, you know, cr people to create around brands, and we've seen so many of those online recently. It's about recognition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the distinction between recognition and reward should be made here. People don't do mashups necessarily to get paid. They do mashups because they're inspired by the combination of a variety of elements, and they want to share that with other people. Well, and and that, that is a valuable undertaking in its own right without the economics associated. Has anyone actually gotten rich or gotten enough to pay for a nice dinner off a of mashup lately? Well, it depends on what you define as mashup. We had an event, that I'm sure people in this room have heard of the Diet Coke and Mentos video. Yeah. So, you know, these guys made $35,000 uh, taking two brands and, you know, creating something kind of explosive, I guess. Um, <laughs> and, and, and that's a big dinner. That's a really fancy dinner. Yes, there's a, there are people making money in this environment, and, and there are ways for brands to be treated well. When that video appeared, Mentos came along and said, I want to buy all the ads, like right now, against this content. That Maybe was they were Mentos. Also figuring that, that cut their ad production costs to nothing. Yes, yes, which is exactly what Pam's talking about Doritos. I mean, Doritos is out there with a the contest. You know, a Super Bowl ad is it's two and a quarter or what, two and a half million dollars yeah, for 30 seconds. Yeah and you spend a million dollars on production, oh, you but you then flip that, you invite the creative community 
to be playful with your brand and then you decide which is the best one, I guarantee you the best ads on, on Super Bowl Sunday are going to be the stuff that you look at and think you could have done that. That's, the, that's what's happening in this <laughs> environment right now. That's what's so exciting about user generated. And that, that, needs to be, uh, that needs to be allowed to flourish, I would suggest. Yeah, but the people who do it for recognition also tend to be very sensitive about somebody else's monetizing it. And, you know, and I think Google, to its credit, is recognizing that it has an issue here in that uh, you know, Wall Street thinks Google will just take all this content for free and then monetize it and make zillions. And I think the Google people are a little smarter than that and realize that there's going to be a lot of resentment if they do that and that they got a share. They're chasing our model, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and I, well, that's, that I think you're being very shrewd about it. And I think that is a very shrewd insight into the whole process. Because like, if, you know, if you deal at all with the open source people, you'll find that one of the things they really resent is when somebody takes their stuff and then uses it to make money. They're if, willing to share, but not to commercialize. It. If you develop sustainable economy for creators online, where they can create and get paid, you're going to see thousands upon thousands of new voices entering the flow of creativity out there. And to me, that is a very good outcome. And a Absolutely. Ver a very Absolutely. good result. Of I'm detecting well, a tremendous amount of agreement on this panel. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, and, and one thing, actually, that's, uh, that I think is a, a good model that Creative Commons has, uh, has offered is the is sort of making stuff available on a non-commercial basis doesn't mean if somebody wants to commercialize it, they don't have to deal with you. Uh, and so I think that's the, that is a, a real value uh, that Creative Commons has introduced into the, to the, into the marketplace. It's not trying to impede, not saying that you have to make a choice about never getting paid or, uh, or, or you know, then having full dress copyright. There is sort of this intermediate uh, uh, opportunity available. Let uh, let people reuse. Let people uh, mash up um, with your stuff on a non-commercial basis. But if you want to mash up for commercial purposes, uh, then uh, you got to talk to me. And I think you know attribution is uh, is turning out to be an incredibly important thing. And fan sites, for example, do a lot of a lot of mm -hmm. remixing type activity too. And attribution is a social norm inside of that community, and I think uh, it's uh, not just the social norm as to me, but a social norm as to the people on top of whose work I'm really building. Now we're going to turn to some uh, user-generated content from the audience. We have some <laughs> questions out there, I believe. Hello, my name is Eli Edwards, and I'm from Santa Clara University School of Law. And my question for the panel is in regards to copyright and user-generated content. And you had you broke back to the future, but I'm wondering what happens with international mashups. I know in the Bay Area where I'm from, you're starting to see a lot of people creating music videos out of Japanese anime, and I'm sure the same thing goes on with Bollywood videos and the like and so forth. And given the um, disparities in copyright and whether or not fair use may exist in different countries. How do you deal with international mashups? Well, that's, uh, that's a really good question. I, I think you issue angry press releases and uh, hope the problem goes away. If you're a well, my reaction studio. was, thank God we've got a law professor on the panel here so she can answer that yeah. one. Um, you know, it is a, it's, a, it's an extremely challenging um, Problem uh, because um, there there are harmonies uh, in in uh, some aspects of copyright law, but there are not harmonies as to everything. Um, I think that there are going to have to be international conversations about it. Right now, you have to say that the only lawsuit that I know about to to require uh, a takedown of a particular. Uh, video was not about copyright. was uh, was about sort of privacy rights of a Brazilian model who was uh, um, videoed in a compromising situation. Uh, and a, Bra a Brazilian On a public beach. <laughs> uh, a, a Brazilian uh, judge ordered that to be taken down from YouTube. The problem was it just proliferated elsewhere. Um, and so uh, the judge finally withdrew his order because it was simply not possible to control. Uh, but I think that uh, you know, if you are talking about um, uh, mashups and, and remixes, I think that there are uh, there are parody and satire 
uh, exceptions in a number of copyright jurisdictions. Uh, and so I don't, uh, I don't know that it's quite as severe a problem, uh, but I do think the next 10 years uh, we're going to have to have some important international conversations about that. And, and a very hard relook at the DMCA. Because right. there's a lot of arbitraging the float of content as it shows up and then you try to chase it off and then it reproliferates and you chase off and it, it is not working. If anybody thinks the DMCA is a functional set of protections, it is not. My name is Nancy Prager. I'm an attorney. I represent musicians, music labels, um, songwriters, publishers, that kind of thing, independents. And what's missing from the conversation, for the most part on this panel, is what's not complex about copyright law in the United States and in other countries. Fundamentally, it's the right of the creator to choose what gets done with their works. They have the power to choose. That's what Section 106, not complicated at all, the exclusive rights fall to the, own, to the creator. They choose what to do with it. If they choose to sign a contract that's bad, with a record label, that's the songwriter or the musician's choice. So if we take it back a step from what you're talking about, which is, by the way, Reaver, awesome, compensating and controlling copyright issues, people really appreciate that. But you can't have this conversation that you're having, Professor Samuelson, in a vacuum. You have to look at what the fundamental rights are. So, and the question I have for you, though, sorry, my fault, I've just been listening to this and hearing this, is when you're talking about this, how can you bring it back and, and literally look at the fact that fair use is a defense, and that's what it is, instead of making it an offense. So let's put it back in that. I would try to start by saying, I guess, yes, copyright does involve the creator gets to decide what happens, but we're talking about not acting in a vacuum. We can't also deny that this is happening, that, that mashups are real. Uh, the same way rap, which relies on the contributions of other artists, is real as well. Uh, the same way musicians have always borrowed ideas from each other before. It is more obvious with a mashup. The question is, I don't think you can have, just strictly as a functional issue, you, you can't hope to stop this sort of thing any more than you can hope to stop any file from being distributed on the internet. What you can do is try to set up, I think, some kind of economic system that makes it feasible for money to flow to the people who contributed the ideas in the first place. Right now, we have a situation where it's easy to put up a mashup and make no, ensure that nobody makes money from it. The creator doesn't make money, he, the original musician. The mashup author, or editor might be the better word, I suppose, they don't make, it, make any money either. They may lose money because their web hosting bill goes through the roof that month. So last time I looked, uh, Section 107 says, notwithstanding uh, 106, um, it's not an infringement to engage in fair use. Um, and so uh, it seems to me the balance is uh, already in the statute. Uh, there's a kind of religious issue about whether fair use is a defense uh, or, in fact, a user right. I think certainly once a court has said something is a fair use, uh, that people have a right to do it. So, uh, for example, after the Sony Betamax case, uh, time shifting uh, is a fair use. From now on, uh, once that decision is made, uh, time shifting is a right that uh, individual uh, users have. Uh, and I think that we have to think about fair use really as an important balancing uh, mechanism, uh, which isn't to say that I'm not sympathetic with efforts to try to get more uh, compensation flowing toward uh, music publishers, uh, uh, performing artists, uh, and recording uh, companies, because uh, I think that that's a, that's a good direction to do, but I think it's got to be a lightweight licensing system if we're going to try to really facilitate this enormous burst of creativity that we've seen uh, with the uh, user-generated content. Remember Time Magazine, what did they do this year? The, the, the person of the year was you. It was you, the people who are creating all this wonderful content. Um, this is something that's really uh, an enormously exciting part of uh, our creative uh, enterprise today. I was going to say all of copyright is based on the idea that the creator has the control. Um, it's simply, though, there are some practicalities, as I see, I keep coming back to transaction cost. And, uh, you know, you, as a social reality, you cannot have it so that you have to go back and get the permission of every 
creator in the chain of title. Um, if you do, people just ignore it. And that is a reality. And, well, and, and that is the state of Hollywood currently and the right structures that have been implied over the last hundred years. Yeah, one last thought. Rob. If we're going to go back to first principles, the Constitution says copyright exists only to help out everybody, society in general, not individual artists. Rob, I have time for one more question, but before sure. I do... Actually, I might dispute that, but this is not the time to do <laughs> okay, that. Okay, well, we'll dispute that in the, uh, over coffee, but um, well, before I have one last question, uh, we go to one last question. Um, right after this, we have three panels, one on net neutrality, one on child safety, and one on digital music licensing. Um, each of those are uh, out to the right, um, and the one on music licensing is all the way down and to the left. Um, in your folder, there's um, the description of which uh, events are where and which room. So um, the last question I think was over here. This gentleman, last question. We have another volunteer. Wow, on the way back. Okay. <laughs> I'm John Potter with the Digital Media Association, and I have an academic question. Is it possible to have a simple, clear, comprehensible to the layman copyright act and have a fair use test, which is four factors that need to be analyzed on a transactional basis? That's a good question, and uh, it's one of the things we'll be taking up. Uh, I think that uh, 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 that fair use uh, case law actually um, falls in clusters, and part of what would be useful to do uh, is to identify uh, those clusters and use them as illustrative of the kinds of things that should be fair use. Um, so that's at least one thought about how to uh, how to move forward with a more robust. Uh, fair use defense and not something that's crabbed by uh, certain interpretations that have been given to certain factors in just one or a small number of cases. Um, but um, can I make a pitch for orphan works legislation? Um, uh, I think actually one of the things that Congress could do this year that would be a real benefit to the user mashup culture actually would be to pass orphan works legislation, especially the clean, sweet uh, version that the Copyright Office recommended. An ordinary person can read that statute and actually can figure out what it means. Uh, if you've made a reasonably diligent effort to locate a copyright owner and you can't, uh, this legislation would allow you to do that, to go ahead and use this stuff, uh, and would limit your damages uh, and would li limit uh, relief if you, uh, if later the copyright owner shows up and says, gee, that's my content, uh, it offers some limitations on liability. I think it's the most constructive thing that Congress could do in this session. Yeah, I think that's clearly true. There's one problem with it, and that is it doesn't solve the search problem. It solves your problem if you know what you want and know where it is, but it doesn't solve the problem of how do you find that book that was published back 30 years ago that you have no idea exists. Oh, Google's working on that. Yeah, well, but that's, you know, so this doesn't solve Google's problem or the problem of anybody else trying to do that sort of search thing. And you need something more, I think, so that we can get the searches going to find the stuff. And then you know what you want and can go after. Last word, Stephen? Uh, I'm just happy to be here, and I think these are very <laughs> big issues, and it's really good that they're getting out there, and we're getting a chance to talk about it. Yeah, we solved them all. <laughs> Thank you.